notes. So now that this webinar is being recorded, we will post the webinar and all of the materials that we're gonna share with you uh, on, the, on the slide presentation on Time Looper's uh, website. It will be up on our website probably about an hour after the webinar ends. Additionally, uh, we're gonna send all the materials to Jason so he can post them to uh, internal WMA resource boards as well. Uh, therefore, what we're hoping is that you spend most of your time focused on the content and a little bit less time worrying about uh, you know, capturing insights or thoughts that you have as we're moving along. Additionally, for those of you who have never uh, participated in a Zoom webinar before, uh, in, your, in the black toolbar that runs across your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A. If you have questions, please type them into that Q&A box and we will answer them. Depending upon the nature of the question, Nikki or I will respond with text or we'll speak to them uh, orally as we're moving through. We've designed the webinar to be very interactive and we've also designed the content presentation to be about 40 minutes. The implication of that is we will do our best to address the questions as they appear throughout the presentation rather than leaving them to the end. However, if the volume of questions becomes overwhelming, we will have to punt on some of the, uh, some of the uh, qu answering some of these questions until the end because we want to ensure that we get through all of the programmed content within the hour. Now, Nick Yeet and I will stay on the presentation as long as required to answer everybody's question after the webinar uh, presentation concludes. So fret not if we don't answer your question when it is asked, uh, but at the same time, we wanna make sure that uh, for those people who do have uh, a hard stop at the top of the hour that we're able to get through everything. So without further ado, we are now going to jump into uh, the material. The title of today's webinar is Starting Up Virtual Tours Quickly. Um, as you can imagine, uh, in these very challenging times where many people are, uh, are required to be staying at home across most of the country, and even for those for whom it's not a requirement, they are, uh, everybody's encouraged to socially distance, uh, many, uh, many institutional partners out there, whether they're museums, historic sites, zoos, um, are now trying to think differently about how they digitally engage with their visitors. Uh, for uh, particularly if they've never um, really considered uh, digital or distant-based uh, digital engagement to be something that's particularly strategic or important. And therefore, what we've done is we've really taken the approach, uh, what is it that you can do in very short order to be responsive to the needs of your community, given the operating environment that we're in? So many of the solutions that we provide are what we believe to be sort of what you would consider Pareto optimal, where we're optimizing for maximum interpretive impact and visual experience uh, and educational outcomes, uh, while recognizing that many of you have limited resources, limited bandwidth, uh, and haven't given uh, virtual and distant-based uh, learning much consideration in the past. Uh, so the, the people that you'll be hearing most from today are both me, Andrew, and Yeet. Uh, many of you met Yeet at the WMA in Boise uh, late in 2019, uh, so uh, we're happy to be with you today, and also Nick is with us. Uh, Nick is in D.C., and uh, I'm just outside of Boston. Uh, but before we dive into uh, uh, providing some thoughts on how to actually build a virtual tour quickly, we want to start by aligning on what VR is. So there are countless definitions out there around what uh, what constitutes virtual reality. And we thought it would be helpful for this group if we aligned around sort of a base case definition um, that, uh, that will be helpful for our shared understanding and conversation moving forward to today. Uh, it's a very simple definition that we deploy, which is that really when you're deploying virtual reality, you are creating an immersive environment that enables the user of this technology to, uh, to put themselves in a different place than that which they are presently. So at the end of the day, if I'm sitting on my couch with my kids uh, and I want to go to the local zoo or I wanna to go to the local historic house, deploying basic virtual reality technology will completely remove us from our at-home environment and put us into that alternate environment. Now there are multiple ways in which that environment can be created and there are even more ways in which that environment can be deployed or experienced by the end user and we're gonna get into all of that. 
But at the end of the day, the objective here is to take people and, 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 and a core differentiator of what makes virtual reality um, so valuable relative to other sort of distance-based education tools is that we're really able to completely put somebody in a different physical space. And then once you put somebody in that different physical space, it really unlocks a host of uh, capabilities uh, and effects and impacts on the user experience, which we'll also get into. In order to create this immersion, there are two primary ways in which uh, you can go about it. The first of which is if you want to immerse somebody in an environment that exists today, um, you can rely on uh, present day photo and video or even scans of these present day places. Again, if you want to show somebody your natural park or you want to take somebody into your art museum, all you need is a 360 degree camera or even just your iPhone. Um, and you can go about creating a completely virtual experience for people because the photo or video that you're capturing with your phone um, or your camera is what it is that you want people to be experiencing at home. Now, what if you want those individuals at home to experience a, a virtual world that, that is not easily replicable by photo or video or does, does no longer exist or never existed? What if you want to show people the impact of climate change 100 years from now? Or what if you want to have people sit next to uh, Lewis and Clark as they made their westward expansion? In those particular instances, you would need to rely on computer-generated imagery to construct that environment that you cannot obviously replicate with present-day photo or video. So before we move forward and talk about the different ways in which you can create these kinds of immersive experiences, whether they're CGI based or photo video, I'm actually gonna now uh, pass the virtual microphone over to Yeet so that way he can showcase for you a couple of different examples of what photo video VR and CGI VR might look like. Thank you, Andrew. So today I'm joining this call via my iPad. And then I'm going to do demonstration through my iPad so that you can see my movement, which also means that you don't have to have a headset to experience this kind of content. So let me show it from my phone. So 360 content is, this is tricky, is a content that is all over the place. When you move your device, you can look at it in every direction. And now I'm going to do the same by moving, turning my, around myself. So now I'm sharing my screen. So this example is from Washington Monument, top of the Washington Monument. It was closed for a period of time and a National Park Service asked us to take a 360 picture from the top so that people can see uh, when they are standing at the bottom of the memorial. And as you can see, this is a present day photo as Andrew was mentioning. And now let me show you is the CGI computer generated version. So the interpretive goal is to talk about the history of Washington DC. So we created Washington DC in 1800s and a couple of other eras. And then this is how DC looked like in 1800s. And then this content is created by using computer. Thank you, Yi. So the, the power of VR doesn't just uh, lie in um, your ability to create a visual experience uh, for somebody else to consume or immerse themselves in from home, but it's what that uh, immersive experience unlocks, right? It's not just the power of visualization, but when you are in the middle of an of a alternate visual uh, environment, um, it provides enhanced context around uh, uh, spatial relationships between multiple points of uh, multiple uh, multiple points. It also enables you to completely uh, unlock your emotion uh, and enhance a, a greater level of meaning. One of the uh, most famous virtual reality film producers has referred to VR as the empathy machine because when you're inside of these environments and you're completely removed from uh, your, your at-home environment, you're really able to transport yourself physically. And when you're able to transport yourself physically, if the person producing this content on the other end has done a really good job of developing interpretive, educational, or even not didactic, but emotive content, you then are able to create a bond with the user where they completely lose touch with their present day environment and they're completely transported to that world that you create. 
The last point definitionally on what VR is that we think is important before we move forward, and this is something that he briefly touched on us, he showed you this experience on his iPad, is that you don't need a high-end headset. Yes, virtual reality content is going to be more immersive when, you, when you're completely blocked off from your, from your present world environment. And the more expensive the headset, the higher the quality, the resolution, the better, you know, all else being equal that customer experiences. But you can't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Every single person in your community, most likely, has access to a smartphone or a tablet device which, uh, or, or a desktop computer which means that you're able to create these immersive virtual experiences and you're able to push them out to your community with the information technology infrastructure that they have in place today. Take advantage of that, right? Why don't you try some things and start quickly and see what works with your community and see how they respond by implementing your virtual experiences on the technology that they have. All they need is a smartphone to get going. So don't. So I would encourage you to disabuse, your, disabuse yourself of the notion that because you don't have access to high-end hardware and many of your users don't have access to high-end hardware, that you cannot create really compelling virtual experiences um, that, have it, that uh, will not have impact for your users. So if we're talking about, um, you know, 360 degree uh, content, the most basic kind of VR content, not the CGI, there are two ways to create that. The first of which is a 360 degree photo, and the second is a 360 degree video. Now, at the end of the day, all these two technologies basically use the same hardware, much like you do when you capture a uh, photo or video of loved ones on your smartphone device. It's just a matter of whether you want to create a photo or a video. Uh, and the nature of those two experiences um, are quite different for the end user. So what I'm gonna do now are show you the difference between 360 degree photo and 360 degree video. Now the way that you would create either of these pieces of content is by, is by purchasing a very basic consumer grade 360 degree camera. The ones that we like the most are the Insta360 One X, the Ricoh Theta 5, and the Garmin Verve. These range in price from $250 to $700. The Insta360 the Insta and the Garmin Verb have an added uh, user, uh, ha have an added benefit for you as the producer, which is that they connect to your smartphone device in real time, which means that you're able to see what the lens is capturing on your smartphone without having to upload any of the images onto your smartphone device or onto your computer to see them. Unfortunately, the Ricoh Theta, at least as of very recently, doesn't allow for that real-time transmission, but it is an otherwise spectacular camera. So for any of these devices, you'll buy it on Amazon or Walmart or wherever you do your online shopping. You know, with two-day free shipping, you'll have it at your doorstep, and then you download the app for any one of these devices onto your, onto your iPhone or your Android phone, and then with a, with a tripod, you're off to the races. You can capture all of this content. Then once you've captured and produced this content, and we'll talk about ways in which you can make it more immersive or more interpretively valuable, um, you would then simply upload it to any, uh, uh, you will then simply also want to upload uh, this content onto um, any of the free publication platforms out there. So you have YouTube 360, um, you have Facebook and Vimeo, which are great if you want to compile a more advanced uh, um, operating device um, such as the Oculus or the Gear VR, you would also have to create an app, which can be done relatively easily. I personally like YouTube 360 the most because people can consume that content from the web, but also they can take that content and consume it on their smartphone on the YouTube app. And then when they start that, uh, that experience on the YouTube app, if they have a cardboard headset at home, all they have to do is slide their smartphone into that cardboard headset and now they have a fully immersive virtual reality experience so because you don't know what hardware people have at home youtube 360 is a really great hack to use to give people access to this content in an immersive environment so to show you were you going to say something oh yeah said also uh, one of the participants said also there's another resource panelium.org it's a free source i'm on the website it looks uh really compelling Okay, great, thank you. Yi, why don't you paste that into the chat so everybody can see that. Um, so just to show That's you- what in the chat. What? Uh, 
send a Q&A. Yeah, so you only have to put it in the chat, please. Okay. Thanks. So, um, so let me show you now what a 360 degree picture or a 360 degree video looks like from, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from, from a desktop. So this here uh, now is a 360 degree photo. This is the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. So for those of you who have never been, uh, it's a spectacular art museum on Fifth Avenue. Um, what they've done is they've taken a series of 360 degree photos and then loaded them onto Google Arts and Culture. So again, this is a web-based platform for people to have immersive 360 degree experiences from your institution. And then you can stitch these photos together and give people a quote unquote virtual tour by allowing them to move point to point. You'll see X's uh, on the floor inside of this environment. Those are the points of view from which these 360 degree photos have been taken. And then you can allow people to jump point to point. Very simple to create, very simple to upload. And importantly, uh, it, it really allows people to physically move through your environment. Um, what I will, will say is that this experience doesn't provide for an interpreter to sort of explain the power of that local visual environment. The experience that I'm going to show you now is from YouTube, and this is an experience from Thomas Edison National Historic Site, where there is an interpreter inside of the foreground of this video that you could capture explaining what it is that you're looking at. Thomas Edison National Historical Park. I'm glad you can join me here in Edison's library, or some refer to it as his office. He spent a lot of time here in West Orange, arrived here in 1887, spent the rest of his life till he passed away in 1931. He did a lot of work here at his desk, and as you take a look at it, you can see there's a lot of papers and a lot of books. His so again, very simple. All that they did was they took a 360 degree camera, they placed a MPS Ranger in the foreground, and then that interpreter described that visual environment. So you can imagine inside of your environment, you already have um, you know, a head of education, a head of interpretation, um, uh, other docents or specialists whom are very well situated to immediately riff on the environment because they give these virtual tours every day. Um, and so if you create, so if you buy, if you have a camera or you buy a camera and then you capture one of these videos, all you have to do is upload it. And then same day you have that VR content. When creating 360 video, we strongly recommend keeping these experiences to under two and a half, three minutes because people do get fatigue. Um, and you're better off creating multiple shorter experiences than one, uh, longer experience. Um, so if you're now going to think about how to actually create this content, there are a couple of things that you should think about because context and meaning are different for various museum environments. So the first thing that we would recommend is to consider the question of why people come to your institution. Do they come to your institution because they want to visualize your, your, your natural landscape? Do they want to learn about a historic moment? Do they want to see the animals? What is it that defines your institution? And then think about how you can port you know, as, 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 as close as possible, that user experience on site into a digital environment. For a public land, if your museum is a natural park or a botanical garden, you're never going to be able to uh, enable users to walk through your park, but you can allow them to explore like we did at the Guggenheim. You can allow them to jump through multiple 360 degree points of view. If your park also has endangered species, you can now take benefit of the intimacy that 360 video provides and allow those individual users at home to get up close and personal to these specific uh, animals. If you want to alternate, if you want to visualize alternate seasons, but it's April, how do you do that? Well, if you have a park that has a robust user community, go out on social media and put out a call to action and ask people if they've taken 360 degree photos in autumn, in summer, in the middle of winter. You know, 360 degree photography is a, is a budding passion of many individuals. And you'll find particularly in these hard times that people are willing to support you by providing access uh, to that content. Um, so also if you're a historic site, one of the things that uh, people find useful um, is um, understanding the grandeur of that place or understanding what made that place important or engaging with historic artifacts. You'll notice the MPS Ranger in the last video was about to go about uh, discussing uh, the different 
artifacts inside of Edison's library and their historical significance, and their historic significance or historical significance. And then of course, if you're a zoo, you know, VR and 360 are amazing tools because they allow the user to achieve intimacy with animals in very immersive environments and also advance understanding of conservation, animal welfare, however you want to interpret those visual environments um, in, in, in a way that's very safe for the animal, safe for the end user, of course, um, and, uh, and of course, very immersive. Regardless of the nature of your museum or your historic site, we would encourage you to consider that people are stuck at home and they're really detached from community. So anything that you do is going to enhance the connective tissue. Now is the time for those of you who've been reticent to try VR production because it's maybe out of your comfort zone. Now's the time to try it. Whatever you do is going to be, per, is going to be received um, with uh, appreciation from your community. I have kids, Yeet has kids. We're actively looking for things to do all day, every day to, uh, to keep them engaged and stimulated. It wouldn't hurt if it was also educational. Use the opportunity to create content, engage with your community and get their feedback. So um, if you want to take these 360 degree environments, whether it's photo or video and make them even more immersive uh, or educational by adding interpretive content to them, it's very simple to do. There are two ways in which, um, oh, you, you didn't tell me, all they still see is the Guggenheim. So let me share my desktop. There we go. Sorry about that. Now, can you see the PDF? I was already seeing the PDF. Yeah, oh, I do not know. Okay. If Somebody said they could only see the Guggenheim. Um, okay, well, good to know that you can see it. So maybe you'll be entertained. Um, so if you want to create even more uh, interpretive content, you can do that both to 360 degree pictures and 360 degree videos. So moving beyond basic photo and video aggregation into this layer of VR content production uh, is, is, is where you're going to get a, a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, so here on 360 degree picture, adding interactive overlays into these virtual environments well, we'll do two things. Number one, it will allow people to learn more because you're embedding additional content into these environments. But just as importantly, is by making it more uh, interactive, you're dramatically enhancing user engagement. And by enhancing user engagement, yes, not only are they learning more because you're adding more content, but they're going to spend a lot longer inside of this environment. You know, we've seen people spend twice as long inside of a 360 degree photo environment uh, when there is interactive content than when there isn't. And if it's a 360 degree video uh, movie, uh, like we had with the MPS Ranger, if you can overlay cinematic uh, virtual effects, um, that would be very powerful as well. So before we move on and talk about how you can actually produce and publish uh, this additional interpretive VR content, I'm now gonna pass the digital mic back to Yi so he can show you a couple of examples of what this type of interpretation does to the overall user experience. Thank you. So again, I'm using my iPad and I'm going to show a couple of different examples in the next couple of slides. So the first one is uh, from uh, how to make a 360 picture more interpretive, more engaging. Um, and then for that one, I have two examples. The first one is an outdoor example. All right, so um, this is uh, East Bay Regional Parks in California. They took th the 360 m picture, so it's very easy by using one of those uh, consumer products. And then they sent us the pictures. And, and then their goal was to say, okay, people cannot come up here, but also we want to provide more information, what we can do, and we discussed, and then we said, what if we can highlight those points of interest? And then this is the outcome. Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park's open space protects land that is vital for the plants and animals who make a home on these hillsides. Bountiful wildflowers. As urban areas around regional parks expand, plants and animals seek out new habitats. Urban oak trees and local... This is again, as you can see, it's very easy. It's, we, have, we use their existing uh, 
content, interpretive content, and then place them on a 360 environment so that when I'm looking around, I know what I'm looking at and what is important. The other example, um, the same applies for any environment. And then let me show you an indoor example this time from Ford's theater. Um, so in this case, we took, uh, so this is from Peterson House, right next to the uh, Ford's theater where um, Abraham Lincoln died. And then when he died in that room, in that house, there are separate rooms. And in each room there were people, and then we have the accounts. So what we did was we put those people's testimonials, and now you can select them and listen from them. I inquired where Miss Lincoln was and was informed that she was in the front parlor. I entered the parlor and found her there entirely alone. After the president died, Dr. Gurley went to Mrs. Lincoln and told her, the president is dead. Why oh. did you not come to me last night, Elizabeth? I sent for you, Mrs. Lincoln asked in a low whisper. I As you can see, again, it's very easy, very simple. This can be about objects in a, in a gallery, or um, it can be an outdoor environment. It applies to any place, and it's the easiest one to create. Um, and then there are more complicated stories to tell. And let me show you a complicated example um, from New York, downtown, and Federal Hall, where George Washington was inaugurated. In this case, you're going to see actors. Um, it's a studio production, present time combined with uh, computer generated content. It has been such an exciting spring. Our new nation's first electoral college has selected Revolutionary War General George Washington to be its first president. Thank you, Yeet. So for those of you who are uh, more ambitious or more technologically inclined, um, you can absolutely uh, go out there and create these interactive uh, experiences yourself. Uh, our favorite tool out there is Pano2 VR, which is created by Garden Gnome. I think a software license is about $150 a month. And you can see here, this is an example of a 360 degree photo where you can add interactive elements um, and you, know, you can give it a go yourself. Alternatively, for those of you who um, maybe would like help, you know, Time Looper is more than able to, to build these interactive experiences for you. And we're gonna to get to it a bit later, but we're offering to do all of this uh, absolutely free for the duration of the COVID crisis. Um, so for those of you who are able to stick around to the end, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can help you to do this uh, at no charge or effort to your institution. So once you have developed uh, you know, the capability to create these interpretive VR experiences, it's worth considering about how you can develop something and get it out the door quickly. And really, at the end of the day, it's worth considering that you already have the content. So don't reinvent the wheel and think about how to create a new interpretive experience specifically for the VR medium. We would really encourage you, especially in these times where speed is of the essence because the need is immediate, to deploy your existing interpretive uh, you know, plans. Play to your strengths. This is an example from the Henry Ford in Michigan where they had a museum scavenger hunt. So imagine an interpreter in the foreground uh, with different 360 degree interactive points in that environment where your student user then has to interact with those different uh, icons to complete you know, the, the scavenger hunt. You know, this kind of example is something that I'm sure will play out, you know, will, can be played out over and over again with each of the institutions that are on this webinar. Think about why people come to your institution what is it that they hope to get from it? How do you meet those needs with your existing interpretive and educational resource plans? And then how can you quickly deploy or adapt those resource plans to 360 degree photo environments with or without interactivity and with 360 degree video? 
Now, all of the pieces of content that we've spoken about so far are individual VR experiences. But what if for your institution, and, and I would argue for most institutions this is the case, there's value in aggregating each of these different experiences into a single customer journey or into understanding the physical relationship between these different 360 degree environments. In that particular instance, what you could do is we could easily develop and deploy for you a walkable virtual map. So if you are a natural park or historic site, we would literally just, we could take a 360, uh, a, a virtual map uh, of your existing footprint. If you are a museum, what we would probably look to do is to look at the content journey that you are deploying uh, and then create a virtual map that aligns to, to, uh, to that interpretive journey. If you're talking about uh, you know, uh, the advancement of allied troops in 1944, then we would create a walkable map of Western Europe, for example. If you're talking about, uh, you know, westward expansion, uh, then might, we might take uh, a walkable map of the U.S. as it looked in the mid-19th century. And then you could deploy each of those different individual pieces of content onto that walkable map environment that get triggered by the user as they're walking. Again, this is something that we're offering to do for you um, at no cost for the duration of the COVID crisis. So if this is something that you think that you would like to deploy, we're happy to help create this because we believe that this kind of interactive functionality dramatically enhances user experience, interpretive understanding, and overall satisfaction. So Yeet, I'm gonna now pass it back to you so you can show people what a walkable virtual map experience looks like. Thank you. So again, I'm going to show an example on my iPad, I'm going to walk inside this space and you're gonna see my screen. And then after that, I'm going to show a couple of pictures that I took when my kids are playing. Let me start with um, the experience, all right? As it is loading now. All right, so in Japan, we, we create this project for Japan Tourism Association. What you're going to see is again, based using the same principle and we create this virtual map for them. What we do is primarily we take satellite pictures. In this case, it, we edited the picture, but usually we take the satellite pictures, we get the terrain, we played, we create this terrain and then integrate content on top of it. In this particular instance, their problem was people are coming to the city, ancient city. It has been witnessed to the most important moments in Japanese history but people don't know which where is where, and then they just don't go and visit those places. So we created this experience to our main visitor center. Let's see what it looks like. Shimonoseki is a city with many stories to tell to her visitors. In some such stories, Shimonoseki played a supporting role. In others, she was the main actor changing the course of history for the entirety of Japan. To hear her stories and witness her history unfold, start exploring by walking on the virtual map. So now I'm going to show you a few pictures. Now we are developing this product for one of our um, partners in California, next to San Francisco Bay Area. So during the development, I also my kids are playing with it. You can make this map as big as you want or as small as you want. Now we all displayed it on the on our dining table. And then my, my son is using an iPad, my daughter is using an iPhone. Uh, actually an Android phone and I'm using my smartphone and I, that's how I took these pictures from my phone's camera as I'm sharing this, my, as if I'm sharing my screen. And then here a couple of pictures, you can see the terrain. Um, here's a quick video looking at how they are looking at it and interacting with it. We have not put the interactive content on it yet, but just showing the terrain. And then, and, and this map can be, you can adjust the size. And then here's, we went out to the yard. He's looking at it in a much bigger scale, even bigger. 
and even bigger. And then there he is. So, um, so this is how it works. Ye here's, Ye a here's a question. Yes. How does one, how does one actually walk, walk on the map? So this is an augmented reality obje object. So you are seeing this map through your phone. So we are placing this um, object onto any environment. And then um, when you move, you can move this. Like the examples that I showed earlier was only 360 degrees looking around. So it's one dimensional in terms of my mobility. I can only look around. In this case, this is a real time object. As I walk, the camera is showing the parts that I walk through. So we call it real time technology. Um, let's see the video. Thank you, but maybe it's easier to see. You see they're walking around this object now, not inside, but also they can walk through the map as well because this is not physical, they cannot touch. Thank you. Thank you. One, other, one, other, one, other question, one other question for you. Um, um, what format would you like, would like them to like send this data, data in? in? Some of them Some have, have, have JSON files. files. Yeah, so oh, it's, it's as simple as sending the coordinates or on Google Maps. You, so you're gonna give us the coordinates of the parts that you want to see. Then our algorithm takes the satellite images from different sources, the terrain, the size, the, uh, the patterns on it, and then puts them together, combines a couple of different sources. And then, um, then you have the, uh, oops. So that's how you access to it. So it, it is, we, the only thing we need is the uh, coordinates. Thank you. So everything that we've spoken about so far, including this map technology is what we would call on demand, where you create it and it gets hosted and then. And then before uh, that, Andrew, can you also show the next slide? Sorry, that's a good, yeah. So it doesn't have to, this is how it looks like when you put a, a 2D content. So uh, we haven't integrated that in the, in the example that I showed you where my kids are using, but you will be walking towards it or just getting closer to it if it's on a table and then to the content pops up, but it's going to be 360 picture. It can be any type of content that you have or you can create in the future. And that's a good visualization of that. So thank you. So all of this content that we have showed you is basically on demand where you create the content and then you upload it to platforms where people can make use of it. But an additional technology that we have is what we call VR conferencing, where what you could do is you could create one of these AR maps. And this map could obviously be a map as we see it, or it could be a historical timeline, et cetera. And then you would facilitate just like the, we're doing now, VR sessions where you would enable school groups or families with kids or whatever your target demo is to come into these virtual environments where you could then facilitate a guided tour. Um, your interpreter, your head of education, whoever's running this would actually have to have an Oculus headset on, whereas everybody else who's using it would simply be using a tablet or a smartphone and they could run the tour from their home or for wherever they're sheltering. And then each of the individuals inside of this virtual environment would have the experience as he has showcased it, but then they could also ask questions or listen to the avatar of the, uh, of the tour guide as they're moving through. So that way you're facilitating two way real time uh, engagement. You could also turn this into a recording where we could record these uh, VR sessions and then upload them onto your VR platform. So then that way people who come, uh, when there when there is not a live VR session, they could consume each of these VR conferences as if they were watching it now, but it would be a unique uh, interpretive journey. So every time you're adding a new layer of content through VR conference, you could record it and upload that to enhance um, the usability for, for, for your entire community. So we've been speaking about a lot of different types of interpretive content. And if speed is the name of the game, we believe that 360 degree video and 360 degree interactive pictures like we saw in East Bay and for Ford's theater are definitely gonna be the place where you're able to uh, sort of maximize uh, between the, the trade-off of time to create content and the relative uh, um, level of immersion of, of that product. And so we would recommend definitely, you know, like whereas with 360 photo, you could capture and upload it immediately. We don't believe personally that it will have that much value for your users in the long run because there's no 
level of interpretation to support it. Whereas the, the uh, Federal Hall piece of content that we showcased to you is a really compelling piece of uh, visual content that enhances interpretive understanding, but takes far too long to produce. So focusing on the pieces of content where you can quickly deploy interpretive content and get it up quickly is where we would recommend spending the most of, most of your time. But then once you've built it, it's not enough to you know, rely on field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. So we strongly recommend using different channels that you've already built up to make your community aware of these resources. So for example, on the left, you know, when people go to your website, put up notifications with hot links to your resources. If it's on YouTube 360 or if it's on Palladium or if it's on uh, you know, the Time Looper app, you know, give people hot links so they don't have to think and they can directly go to that content. If you have you know, these VR tours that you've set up um, or you have the map platform and the map platform aligns to the typical eighth grade biology field trip that you tend to offer every April, reach out to all of the schools and all of the teachers who bring students every year to your site and let them know that the, these resources are available. Um, doing that will dramatically enhance the, the, the uptake and consumption of these resources. Teachers, parents, are already so overwhelmed trying to figure out what to do that if you put these things in front of them and make it easy for them, you know, they're going to see a lot of value in that. If you do decide that you want to work with Time Looper to either create this map platform or do, uh, you know, standard 360 interactive experiences using the Time Looper app, you know, it's really a five day process. So, you know, in the first day or two, you're focused on giving us geo coordinates and uploading all of your interpretive assets you know, in 36 hours, we're taking those assets and creating your map platform and embedding it and then creating your custom white label application. And then in days four and five, the last 36 hours, we are launching this app for your approval and then for your entire community to use. And then it's really up to you how you would make use of it. Um, so just a couple of final best practices uh, that we wanna highlight. So number one, finding a partner who's committed to keeping their platform updated is very important. Starting with a manageable interpretive content journey that you find to be digestible and sufficiently doable in a short amount of time is important. You might have a large museum, you might have multiple exhibitions, both permanent and temporary. Start with one, create three, four, five pieces of content that are sufficient to create a comprehensive journey particularly when aligned to maybe a graphic organizer or offline educational content and lesson plans that you provide. But don't try to do the whole museum at once. You know, this crisis is not going away in the next week. So if you can create content in the next couple of weeks and then push out new content, you know, every week or every two weeks or every month, then you are going to, um, uh, then you are going to develop an ongoing relationship with your community and they're going to get really excited about what comes next. You could even use social media after you launch the first one to get feedback from them and ask them what uh, additional content they'd like to see in the future. Um, additionally, when you're thinking about that interpretive journey, as I mentioned with the school group, you know, start from your existing customer base and their needs and then back into the content you wanna create. Don't start from the existing photos that you have. Start from the needs of your community and then work back and then you know that the content will be much more relevant. Um, moving forward, this is something that we just wanna highlight again. So in, um, in terms of what it is that we're offering to all of you, everything that we do, we're gonna be doing gratis for the duration of the COVID crisis. And we really mean that. We're happy to help you create uh, all of your VR content. We're happy to deploy that content in the Time Looper app or on our platform. We're happy to create walkable maps and deploy VR conferencing functionality for you. All of that is absolutely free. I do see a question from somebody who said, well, what happens after the COVID crisis? Um, after the COVID crisis ends, uh, and that's gonna be different for different parts of the country. And frankly, we're not in a hurry to help you create this and then take it away. You know, Part of when the COVID crisis ends is gonna sort of be up to you to determine when you're back up and running you know, in a relatively normal environment, whatever that new normal means. Um, for those of you who create in individual VR content experiences and deploy it on the Time Looper app, it's gonna be $149 a month after COVID, uh, month to month, no contract. For those of you who want to use the map platform after COVID ends, it's I think $349 or $399 a month after COVID, month to month uh, with absolutely no risk. So what we would tell you is, 
If you want to go create content using these resources that we've made available, please go do so. And if you have any questions about how to upload content to Facebook, we're here to help. If you want us to do it for you and you want to see how it goes, let us work with you to build this content. Let's launch it. And then over the next three, four months, you'll have an opportunity to find out whether it's something that you find of value and your community finds valuable. And then from there, you can make a more informed decision. Um, well, another question that we had was, are there links that we can uh, provide to you to, um, uh, to help you make this content? These are all the links that we think that you need. So um, this is a question specifically that Jill asked. Jill, when this webinar gets um, uploaded uh, onto our website later today, then you'll be able to click any of these links and go to where we believe that you need to go to create all of this content. Um, additionally, there will also be a recording of the uh, webinar up on our website, you know, in an hour. So that way, if you want to rewatch it, or if you would uh, like to socialize it with members of your community, uh, they're absolutely able um, to, uh, to, to consume it, uh, you know, um, you know, at, at their leisure. So uh, with that, um, Yeet and I uh, and Nick are happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, and, uh, and let's go from there. So the floor is open to questions or comments. There's one question from Zachary about creating um, historic pictures visualization. Um, for that one, if you're especially asking for Washington Monument, um, we are using movie production techniques like, you know, um, in the movies you have the green studio and then backdrop and then it's called matte painting, technical term. So we use those techniques to create that uh, type of content. Um, need the link to sign up, please. Hold on, hold on, I'm gonna, hold on. And for those of you who don't have the time or the resources to build a matte painting, one of the things that you can do is do a perfect overlay of your environment. So if you right. have a 360 degree environment and you have a photo from that same perspective from 100 years ago, Overlaying that photo won't give you the complete 360 immersion, but it will certainly give you enough of an, uh, of an effect that you can uh, simulate at least a portion of that. So somebody asked where to sign up. So this is the Time Looper homepage. Um, and then uh, right here on the Time Looper homepage, you'll see uh, um, the, if you are already informed and want to sign up, click here. It's that simple. If you want additional information about our uh, program for the COVID crisis, what, what we're calling Time Looper Foundations. In the upper right hand corner is what we call COVID support. And this details, you know, much of what we've discussed today as it relates to the Time Looper Foundations program. All right, other questions? This time we don't have the money for 360 camera gear, no stuff on site to run it, but it's very interesting. I, for the map platform, you don't have to have a 360 content. And actually right now, um, most of the institutions reaching out to us has the same question. Okay, so either saying that I don't have 360 content or resources, or they say like my park is closed, I cannot go inside and then take 360 pictures. Um, and then you can easily start with the footage that you have, whether it's the two pictures, 2D videos, and then just you can, we can put those on the virtual map and then it's ready to go. And then later on, if you happen to have 360 content from someone, or if you take it by yourself, we can always add that to later on. All right, other questions? Uh, let's see what we have here. We have something in the chat. Oh. I was seeing PDF. Uh, Bill, not sh oh, okay. Uh, other questions? All right, well, we're, uh, we're here to help. So please let us know what it is. Oh, here's another question. What's the best way to get in touch with you? So again, so you can email us. Here's our email addresses. Uh, but the absolute best way to uh, sort of go through the, the program is to go to the Time Looper website and click on, click here to sign up for Time Looper Foundations, um, as I just walked you through. But again, if you just want to email us, that is sufficient as well. So whatever is easiest for you.
How quick is the turnaround? So after you, we, if for the map platform, um, after we receive the coordinates and then the SS that you want to display on this map, um, then it takes um, 24 hours to put them, put all this thing together so that we can give, you can start testing. Um, so just to be safe, let's say that two days. And then um, the process is, We'll have an introduction call and we'll talk about provide more details and provide you the guidance uh, document. And then um, you'll go back and then you look at your assets, you define your customer journey, the stories, and then send us those assets and then the coordinates. Then we will build the prototype app for you and then send it back to you for your review. And once you approve, then we send it to the App Store. Then App has um, Apple Store or Google Play, they have their own review. Um, uh, durations I mean because of the crisis usually it is in 24 hours but at this time it may take longer we don't know that yet but on our end after you send the assets it can be as has as fast as as 24 hours okay any other questions Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll stay on up. Oh, let's see. Um, we will stay on until everybody is gone in case anybody changes their mind. Um, again, we're more than happy to answer any questions you have, both as it relates to time looper products uh, and also to these open source products and private company platforms that are free as well, like Google and Facebook and Vimeo, et cetera. Uh, just let me know, uh, just let us know however we can be helpful and best of luck in these trying times. So thank you very much.